couple of weeks ago, we had a message on the close of probation, and we want to just continue the thought of the time of the close of probation. This time is very clear in the scriptures, the time when the door is shut. The text in Luke where the master of the house, when once the master of the house has risen up and hath shut the door, then you begin to stand without and to say, and so the text says in, in Luke. And so this event of shutting the door, the master of the house standing up, this is depicted in Daniel chapter 12, the master, the, the archangel, which is the master of angels, Michael stands up and then there will be a time of trouble such as never was. This time period is referred to in the Bible as the day of the Lord. Not a 24-hour period, but a day as in a time of the coming of the Lord. From the close of probation, through the seven last plagues being poured out, to the appearing of Jesus in the clouds, is what the scripture shows. Is this event, the day of the Lord. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 through to 4. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. This sudden destruction is, is the time of trouble such as never was. So from the time that the time of trouble starts to the actual appearing of Jesus is this day of the Lord. And that close of probation comes as a thief in the night. No, there's no marked event. When Jesus comes in the clouds, is that like a thief in the night? Not at all, because it's, it's everyone will see, every eye will see him. Does every eye see the thief that comes into the house? No. So from the close of probation, which has, has no big bang about it, there's no... Um, spectacular um, happening that the whole world can notice. It's quiet and it happens. And then sudden destruction and they shall not escape. But who will escape? Thy people, Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, thy people at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that is found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt, speaking about the special resurrection. So we see right in this text of Daniel, there is this time period very clearly shown in prophecy, which we are to expect. But one point of how Christ comes as a thief in the night, Christ has a message. This message is given right in the middle of this time of trouble, such as never was. He has something to say about this day of the Lord. And it's written in Revelation 16 and verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Today's subject is entitled Naked. What does it mean to be naked? It means to have no clothes on. That's what it means to be naked. So Christ is simply saying that when probation closes, make sure you've got clothes on. Make sure you're wearing something. Make sure no one is going to take your garment from you. Interesting. Can you have your garment taken from you? 
Be careful not to have your garment taken from you. Because if someone takes your garment, you're going to be naked. You're not going to have any clothes on. Now, of course, this is symbolism. And we're going to re reflect on Matthew 22, where Christ gives a parable about garments, a clo clothing. And in this, in this parable, he likens the kingdom of heaven to a king that made a marriage for his son. Who is the king? God, the, the father, the father. The king is the father and the son is, is Jesus. And then there were servants that sent to invite guests and they made excuses. And just for your own personal study, if you ever want to study anything, you study these three excuses. Three excuses Christ gives, and I believe there's a lot of content in these three reasons why they couldn't come. One, one reason why they didn't come to the marriage was? Okay, possession. They had possessions. What's the second one? Okay, relationships. What's the next one? Things to do, business. He had 12 yoke and oxen, he had to try them out. He had to do something. These three things sum up every reason why people don't want to accept Christ. One of these categories, something falls into that we idolize. Whether it's something that we want to achieve, our own uh, plans, like a business. Not that business is wrong in itself, but it can be a source. And the, the point of trying to accomplish our own projects, our own ambitions can keep us from heaven. Marriage, is there anything wrong with getting married? Not in itself. It can be. But in itself it's not wrong, but it can be a source of losing salvation. If it's the reason why you don't want to go to the marriage supper. I have another relationship. And I don't want to sacrifice that relationship for the relationship of Christ. And not just marriage, but any relationship. Whether it's your child, or whether it's even your pet, or whether it's your friend, it doesn't matter. You can sacrifice your relationship with Christ because of a relationship with something else. And the last one is possessions. Like the rich young ruler, he loved his possessions, they were his idol, houses, land, something that I can call my own. Interesting thing to think about about possessions, that even though you may possess something, do you know who owns everything? God does. Everything you own is actually still owned over and above you by God. And so, something to think about before we sacrifice God over our possessions, considering actually it belongs to God anyway. We need to worship the giver, not the gift. And so, these three categories, Christ comes, and then they reject Him. This is primarily actually talking about the Jews' rejection of Christ, because when they rejected, what did the king do? Burnt up their city. What happened to Jerusalem? You know, this is a prophecy of Jesus predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. And then the message went to the Gentiles. And then you have a garment introduced. This garment is introduced. And the king comes in to inspect the guests. This is reaching down to the time of investigation. The king comes in to investigate each guest. And on his investigation, it says here, and when the king, in verse 11, and when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither, not wearing, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He was speechless. In other words, he didn't have any excuse. 
If I said to you, if I said, why aren't you wearing that pink jacket, Michael? Why aren't you wearing it? What would you think? If I literally asked you that, what would you think? What would you say to me? <laughs> hey, what pink jacket? I didn't know about a pink jacket. This man was what? Speechless. Did he know about the garment? Could have even had a garment. Every guest was given. It's a gift. The garment was the gift. And he came in and what was the problem? He wasn't wearing the garment. The fact that he's silent means he had no excuse. He, he knew about it. If you didn't know about something, you'd honestly say, look, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know about this garment. I didn't know it was a requirement. Here this man is speechless, which indicates that he knew about the garment and it's highly likely he was even given a garment. Revelation 16 and verse 15 said, Blessed is he that watcheth and keeps his garments. Do you think this man lost his garment? Is it possible to lose that which Christ gave? So the garment is simply the righteousness of Christ. Christ's character, his temperament, his, pers his personality, his, his way of, his attributes which he holds. When you read the life of Christ and you see these beautiful gems of what type of person Christ is and what attributes he displays, you're looking at the garment. It says in Christ's object lessons, This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character and this character he offers to impart to us. Now we call that justification, impartation of righteousness. It continues on further down in the same quote, but further down it says, When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart, the will is merged in his will, the mind becomes one with his mind, the thoughts are brought into captivity to him, we live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, nor the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. What's that called? What do we call that? The wearing of the garment. We call that sanctification. The receiving of the garment, being given it into my hands. We call it justification. And the placing of the garment on, we call that sanctification now the problem is that i believe too many people try and define the two to make them two distinct things why ever would you have a garment that you don't put on this man who was come who, who came to the wedding had no excuse whatsoever he was silent he had nothing to say that simply is telling us he had a garment why aren't you wearing the garment why aren't you wearing it? I gave it to you and you're not wearing it. What's his problem? Did he experience Christianity in any degree? Yes, he did. What was his problem? He, he, he boasted in justification to the neglect of sanctification. Isn't that the case today? That we can rejoice in the forgiveness of our sins and that Christ is offering to place on our account in heaven, in the ledgers of heaven, all his attributes placed upon our account in heaven. And we think, wow, that's good. And it is good. But unless that, those attributes become mine, God's going to ask me a question. Excuse me, why aren't you wearing the garment I gave you? 
you know, if you brought a, f- a present for a friend and, and it was a, you brought them some clothing and, and then you found out they never wore the gift, how would you feel? Just on an earthly level. You feel like, oh, that was a bit of a waste of money, a bit of a waste of effort. They didn't like it. But if you saw them always wearing what they had purchased you and you always saw them wearing it, you'd think they actually really liked it. So I'll ask you a question. Do you really like justification? Honestly, do you like it? Because if we like it, we'll wear it. If we really, truly appreciate the gift of Christ, honestly, we will be sanctified. We can't really separate the two. To try and separate the two and say, I'm a, I, you know, I don't believe in living a holy life before Jesus comes, is simply saying, I don't really appreciate the gift of Christ. I don't want to wear it. Because when the king comes in to inspect the guest, he has one question to ask. Why aren't you wearing the garment I gave you? And what are you going to say? I didn't know about the garment. Or are you going to say, nothing. Because there's no excuse at all. And so this is the scene here. That we can be given the garment. We can... We can appreciate, to a certain degree, the gift of Christ, and then it can be taken off us. And that's why Jesus says, in the time of trouble, when the probation closes, the message to his people is, make sure you've got your garment. Coming into the close of probation, the message is, make sure you've got your garment, not in your hand, but on you. Because if you don't have your garment on, if you don't have any clothes on, what are you? You're naked. One or the other. Either has the garment on or doesn't have it on. There's only two classes. The Bible puts it in another way. Gives it another illustration. Not about garments, but about a mark or a seal. And it's in Revelation 13, starting in verse 15. And then we're going to read to the next chapter, verse 1. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak... And cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all both great, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the number of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is for it is the number of a man. The number is six hundred three score and six. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Two classes of people. Two marks. Notice the mark of the beast, this number, is what? In verse 17, the number of his, what? Name. So the mark of the beast represents the name of the beast. And the seal of God is the name of God. What's it about? Two names. There's only two groups. A lot of people are really interested with the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? All you actually need to be concerned about is what the mark of the seal of God is. Because if you get the mark of the seal of God, the, the Father's name in your forehead, you can't get the other. You either have one name or the other. One's the name of a man, it's, men, it's humanity's mentality versus the divine mentality. Which one are you going to have? One is being clothed and the other one is being naked. Because the name of God, many people, there's a lot of people that are getting involved in the, how to say God's name the right way. Or how to spell it the right way or spell it without spelling all the words and making asterisks and things in the middle so you don't actually spell it. And then having the right 
pronunciation like the Jewish name. And I believe strongly that it's totally missing the point. The name of God, Exodus three thirteen to 15. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, what shall I say unto them? The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The God, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name, how long? Forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Includes today. What is the name? God is who he is. His name is more his character than the pronunciation of some Jewish words. Misses the point. Let's not get sidetracked with words. Let's delve into the meaning, the inspiration that's behind them. Psalms 38, 138 verse 2. Tells us, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. What's more important than the name itself in its lettering? What's more important? What's magnified above it? His word. His word is who he is. In the beginning was the word. It's it's who He is. I am who I am. That's who I am. That's my name. I, the personage, the, the character traits that I am. The glory. You know, Moses wanted to see the glory of God and he, he showed himself to, to Moses. Moses knew who God was. He proclaimed the name of the Lord and he said, The Lord, gracious and merciful and kindness and all these wonderful traits that balance justice and mercy perfectly. In a being. That has to become our mentality. That character trait, the perfect blend of mercy and justice in the personage of Jesus Christ as displayed in his life has to become our mentality. That is what it means to wear the garment. Not that Christ is my representative. He stands before me. He is kind and I'm aggro, but it's okay because he's in front of me. Therefore, I can be aggro and nasty and mean because Christ is not. That's having the garment, but not putting it on. And coming back to the in time of investigative judgment, if we don't put it on in our practical life, that we think his thoughts, that we, our will is merged in with his will and that we live his life, the question will be asked, why aren't you wearing that beautiful gift I gave you? Five Testimonies, 216, paragraph 1. What are you doing, brethren, in the great work of preparation? Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and are preparing for the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? It's the worldly mold. They're getting molded in a mentality. Can you see how, how our society is shoving a mentality across people certain way of thinking it's the number of a man it's the number of his name what it is it's the characteristic and it's in stark contrast with that of God those who are distrustful of self who are humbling themselves before God who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character 
will remain pure and spotless for eternity. The garment is character. Your character is your habitual thoughts and feelings that you cherish. That make your actions what they are. That govern your course through your life. Those particular thoughts and feelings that you hang on to. And make it that, that you cherish. Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious, world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. All who receive the seal must be without spot before God. Candidates for heaven. Go forward, my brethren and sisters. I can only write briefly upon these points at this time, merely calling your attention to the necessity of preparation. Search the scriptures for yourselves that you may understand the fearful solemnity of the present hour. Ezekiel gives another picture. Go through and put a mark on the on every person who's sighing and crying for the abominations. Repentance. And sorrow for sin is what should be characterizing our life. And not just repentance and sorrow for sin, but worshipping and admiration of the character of Jesus. Those two things. When we see Christ in his character traits as we study his word, we are to search the scriptures for they testify of Jesus. And as we look at them, like we had in our Sabbath school lesson, here we had the story of Lazarus. Lazarus. But what we could have the privilege of doing is seeing Jesus in action and stopping and dwelling upon that. That mind occupation will affect us profoundly as we keep doing it. Now, the interesting thing about the close of probation is that it's more than just a choice. When you want to serve the Lord, when you want to be on the Lord's side, what do you need to do? You need to make a choice? You need to make a decision in your life for the Lord? Well, there comes a time when a decision is too late. And I want to bring that to our attention because the decision must be made with action. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4 through to 17. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. A root of bitterness? What sort of actions come from bitterness? You just think of that. That's the thing that we need to avoid. And then here, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward... When you would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he had found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Here came a time in Esau's life when the decision was actually too late to make. A decision is only good if it can be carried out. And have you ever come to a point in your life where you can make a decision and but you can't do anything about carrying it out? Peter was in a situation he needed divine help to actually carry it out. What was his decision about the Lord and and just before the Lord is crucified? Peter answered and said to him, 
Though all men should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Was that a firm decision of Peter? Do you think he honestly meant that decision? But did that decision change his course of character? Didn't. What needed to take place was some working of divine intervention that was to profoundly impact him so he wouldn't be offended. His mere decision is not enough. You need something else. And here Peter... He denies the Lord. Three times Christ said, Before the, the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. And so the event takes place, and Peter starts denying his Lord once, twice, third time. And on the third time, what sound did he hear? The rooster crowing. Who controls the roosters? <laughs> You know, like seriously, what like what impact would have that made? Like here's Jesus hours before says you before the the rooster will crow. Like God knows when roosters crow. <laughs> he does. But he knows more about us. He says, Before the rooster crows, you're gonna die, deny me three times. I will never do that. And then as he does it, who does he look to? He looks to Jesus. And what look does he get from Jesus? Love and pity. It wasn't just, you're, you're finished. It wasn't that sort of look. Love and pity. What is it that is going to change your character? Your mere decision, I will do this. Or is it gaining a glimpse of Jesus' care for you personally. That will change you more. That will actually make your decision doable if you get a glimpse of Jesus. But if you want to get a glimpse of Jesus, we must do it while we can see Him. Last the, Two weeks ago we had the sermon and one of the texts in the sermon was Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. We want to make our decision during the time when we can see Jesus. When we can appreciate his love. While there is mercy lingering. But if I make my decision afterwards, my decision is nothing. Without being coupled with the love of Christ. So we come to the parable of the ten virgins. Was it, did there come a time it was too late? Character. What is needed? What is needed to go through the time of trouble such as never was? A garment. You need to wear a garment. The putting on the garment is the development of your character. The giving of the garment is the gift of Christ's character for you to behold and make your own. What I'm suggesting here, what the Bible is actually presenting to us is that to survive the close of probation, you have to have sanctification completed. Does it happen as quick as justification? I can. The, we, we always refer to the, the thief on the cross. He was, he was saved in a second. On his deathbed. And many people draw that and think, well, I can do the same. But when it comes to the close of probation, let him who is holy be holy still. And him who is filthy be filthy still. It's not applicable. Because we need to live in the sight of a God without a mediator. 
We need to have the garment on. We need to have the attributes of Christ before probation closes. What a privilege to be able to have. And just the mere decision of, I'm going to put it on now. Can you do it? There's actually a time period that it's too late to develop. Statement says it's almost too late to develop character. Now this isn't to be discouraging, but this is a serious time in which we live. It is to awaken us to the sense of, I need to occupy my mind on putting the garment on. It is the word of God. This is from Education, page 108. It is the word of God, the impartation of his life that gives life to the seed. And of that life, we, in eating the grain, become partakers. This God desires us to discern. He desires, he desires that, every, that even in receiving our daily bread, we may recognize his agency and we may be brought into a closer fellowship with him. By the laws of God in nature, effect follows cause with unvarying certainty. Character is very unforgiving. The character you develop when the door's shut is the character you're going to have. And if it's not a good character, can we blame God? Has God given all the means for us to develop a good character? He's given us the garment. We just have to put it on. In Revelation, there's, there's two... There's two um, Two classes of people. One, they wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb and make them white. The other, to them are given garments. This marks the two segments of, of Christian development. One, before the investigator judgment and one after. We've all been given garments. But this parable that Christ said was there is a time of inspection to see if it's on. In other words, God is expecting the garment to be worn by every single follower of his without exception. And the only way to tell whether you're wearing it is whether you're wearing it. That's, that's the only way. If you've got it on, you've got it on. If you don't, you're naked. The question was, why aren't you wearing it? By the laws of God in nature, effect follows cause with unvarying certainty. The reaping testifies to the sowing. Here, no pretense is tolerated. Men may deceive their fellow men, and may receive praise and compensation for service which they have not rendered. But in nature, there can be no deception. On the unfaithful husbandman, the harvest passes sentence of condemnation. And in the highest sense, this is true also in the spiritual realm. It is in the appearance of not in reality that evil succeeds. The child who plays traunt from school, the youth who is slothful in his studies, the clerk or apprentice who has failed of serving the interests of his employer, the man in any business or profession who is untrue to his highest responsibilities may flatter himself that so long as the wrong is concealed, he is gaining an advantage, but not so. He is cheating himself. The harvest of life is character. And it is this that determines destiny, both for this life and for the life to come. Harvest, the harvest of life is what? The character. What is the second, of coming, the second coming of Christ likened to? 
the harvest? With the sickle, the sickle coming to gather the harvest? What we have is the first time in Earth's history, all characters of our planet will be developed. Now you think, well, how could ever that happen? What develops character? The choices you make. And the choices you make, especially under trial. You have a trial, what do you want to do? I want to get out of it. I get out of all my trials, what sort of character will I have? Brother Stuart read it this morning. Really powerful reading. Appreciated it. If we dodge each trial, we will have a deformed character. On the other hand, if we go through the trial and come out of it victorious, we'll develop a good character. So in Earth's history, when has there been more trials than ever before? You think of the logistics of our planet now. We live in a time that there are so many trials more than ever before. Why? Why is that? The reason why is because everyone's characters will be developed. Christ watches the history of the earth over the 6,000 years and right at the end, he turns up the heat. All he has to do is pour in more trials and that will develop people one way or the other. It's the summer heat of the harvest. The sun beats down upon that grain and it dries out. In other seasons, it can't do it. And so we live in a world that has a social structure, that has an has a, uh, entertaining structure, that we have a mentality today that is designed to finish off people's character quickly. The harvest is a production of the seed sown. Every seed yields fruit after its kind. So it is with the trial traits of character we cherish. Selfishness, self-love, self-esteem, self-indulgence reproduce themselves. And the end is wretchedness and ruin. What does the Apostle Paul say in the last days? What would happen? In the last days, perilous times would come. Men would be lovers of their own selves. Boasters, proud, high-minded, heady, so on and so on. The Apostle saying, in the last days, it's going to be like that. In other words, according to the Bible, we do live in a time where self-love, self-esteem, self-indulgence is at a height that has never been before. The events have always been there. Selfishness has always existed. But the height and the culmination of it, how quick can you get pleasure nowadays? You can get pleasure really quick. Even in poor countries. All people have to do is pull out their mobile phone and look up some pornography or something and they've got their pleasure they want. That's what the world do. Just like that. 200 years ago, how hard would it be? Compared to today. Oh, a lot harder. You would have had to go through a whole lot more rigmarole to get the same sort of pleasure that you can in seconds today. And so the Apostle Paul, so accurate when he said in the last days, perilous times will come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Character is developing at a fast pace today. Really fast pace. And while that's true on the negative, how quick and easy can you get a glimpse of Jesus' love through his word today? Can you pull out your phone and get a glimpse of his love by the scriptures or the Spirit of Prophecy database or you know, communicating with brethren, fellowship much faster than you could to be able to talk with loved ones in a, in a godly way. It's, it's, it's just as powerful on the positive as on the negative except men are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God so the Negative gets favoured far more than does the godly. It shouldn't be amongst us though. 
We should love God more than we love pleasure. He that hath sown to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Love, sympathy, kindness yield fruitage of blessing, a harvest that is imperishable. And then from councils to T, uh, no, CT. I think, um, I think it's something else. No, that's not either. Um, anyway, CT, page 20. There is a science of Christianity to be mastered. A science much deeper, broader, higher than any human science. As the heavens are higher than the earth, the mind is to be disciplined, educated, trained. For men are to do service for God in ways, catch this, in ways that are not in harmony with inborn inclination. We are to do, uh, we are to do service for God in ways that are not in harmony with inborn inclination. What does inclination mean? It's that which you tend to lean towards. Do you like doing that which you tend to like doing? <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? So natural, it's so human. But is it divine? Even in missionary work, I mean, who are we all comfortable doing certain things? Should sometimes we go out of our comfort zone to do things? You bet. You look at this statement from 8 Testimonies 313. Blew my mind. Paul's sanctification was the result of a constant conflict with self. He said, I die daily. This, his will. His will, his desires, every day conflicted with duty and the will of God. Instead of following inclination, he did God's will, however crucifying it uh, crucifying to his own nature. Wow. You know, you often think of the Apostle Paul. He was just like this person who just wanted to do God's will every, every second. He just banded out of bed thinking, I'm just going to obey God and everything. And he just went and did it. That's how we picture him. But here, the Apostle Paul, that person who displays the gospel, presents the gospel as we know it today. Here is this person who in the simple word says, I die daily means that his will, his desires, every day, conflicted with duty and the will of God. You know when it says that self is dead? Do you know what that actually means? It doesn't mean that the carnal nature is now longer, no longer active. It means that it no longer has rulership. The position of rulership is dead. This is what it says, I die daily. Here we can see that the Apostle Paul has this battle between his own inclination and that of the will of God. What is going to be the master? And in the life of Paul, what was the master? God's was. And that is equated with self-dying. Now the next day, did he no longer have any problems? <laughs> no, he had to do the same thing. So when we read in, in Hebrews where it talks about mortify the body and so on, some people have, have a belief that when you reach conversion, something is eternally dead, as in you never have any more internal um, battles within you know, the, self, the sinful flesh is not active anymore. It's actually killed and it, once it's dead, it's dead. That's a false teaching. The mastery of the flesh is dead. Yes. It's crucified. Its position as rulership in my life is being killed. And tomorrow I've got to do it again. That's forming character. If we only do things we want to do, we will never form a right character. No other science is equal to that which develops the life of the student in the student. Sorry, 
I'll start again. No other science is equal to that which develops in the life of the student, the character of God. In other words, there's a science on how to get dressed. How to put the garment on is a science. Those who become followers of Christ find that new motives of action are supplied. New thoughts arise. And new, and new actions must result. Did you notice that? It says here, new motives of action are supplied. It's like you've been given a garment. New thoughts arise. Now you get some thoughts coming in. And then? And new actions must result. What's your result going to be? When Christ gives you that garment, those, those new thoughts, wow, that's a, to love your enemies? Really? That's a totally different way of thinking. What am I going to, oh, that's impossible, I can't do that. And then we go back to hating our enemies. If, if we have these new motives and new thoughts arise, then new actions must result if we want to have our garments on. But they can make advancements only through conflict. For there is an enemy who ever contends against them, presenting temptations to cause the soul to doubt and sin. There are hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil that must be overcome. Appetite and passion must be brought under the control of the Holy Spirit. There is no end to the warfare this side of eternity. But while there are constant battles to fight, there are also precious victories to gain. And the triumph over self and sin is is of more value than the mind can estimate. Beautiful statement. So, to close with, I just want to challenge your thinking. How do you form a character? Well, we already talked about it. It's thought, it's your thought processes, the things that you cherish. But how can I put the garment on? How does this actually happen? 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2 and 3. 2 Corinthians. And actually the whole passage is really important to understand properly. This passage is often used by people to teach that the Ten Commandments is no longer binding. But it actually teaches the exact opposite. If it's studied carefully and prayerfully. Second. Corinthians 3, reading in 2 and 3, Ye are our epistles, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Have you ever heard the term that you could be the only Bible someone will ever read? Have you ever heard the term that if you judge someone, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover? What are you equating a person to? A book. And here this text is saying, it's comparing the Ten Commandments, which was written on stone. The Ten Commandments is to be lived in living principle. And that you're known and read of all men. In other words, people can be reading the Ten Commandments without reading the Ten Commandments. They can see your life and they will be learning the lessons of the Ten Commandments. And they don't even know they're reading Exodus 20 in your life. So what does it tell us about the Scriptures? They are to be ingested into our life now let's go back down to verse 12 i encourage you to read the whole chapter it's a really good study chapter to really study out and to comprehend it it's, it's such a blessing but verse 12 seeing then that we have such hope we use great plainness of speech and not as moses which put a veil over his face 
that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. What, it, what the Apostle is saying is that the Jews misunderstood the Bible. They didn't get the point. They read it, yes. They saw the words of it, but the thought processes that came from it were wrong. Even to this day, there remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. They couldn't steadfastly look. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, he asked to see the glory of God in character. And he saw it. What happened to Moses' face after he saw the glory, not just saw it, but heard the glory of God in all its glory? What happened to the physical face of Moses? It shone really bright. And he came down to the Jews, to the Israelites in the camp, and his face was so bright that they couldn't look at it. They had to turn their head away until he put a veil over his face and then they'd look at him. That was a typified of how they read the Bible. What did Moses get? The character of God from the Bible. He saw the Lord is gracious and merciful and long-suffering and, and abundant in goodness and truth, but will in no wise clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children and children to the third and fourth generation, to them that hate me. That's what he got a glimpse of, the balance between mercy and justice. And he saw it perfectly. And then when the Jews read the Old Testament, did they get the balance right? Were they merciful? Not at all. And even today, do people understand the Old Testament properly? Do they still think that there's the God of the Jews and then there's the God of the Christians and there's a Jewish dispensation and the Christian dispensation and there are two different ways of getting salvation? One was one by works, this one's by faith. And all these doctrines that come out is all a result of the same Jewish error of reading the Old Testament wrong. Because what's it all about? It's all about the character of God. How you view God. That is so important. That is essentially the key to putting on the garment. Let's continue reading. from. We read verse 12 and verse 13. The veil is done away in Christ. In other words, every time I read the Old Testament, I need to come out with an attribute like displayed in Jesus' life when he was on earth. If I'm coming out with something different, I'm reading it wrong. I'm not seeing the broader picture. I'm stuck on a few little words that, that are going to trip me up. It's the veil. That, it's the stumbling block that people have tripped over. Verse 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with what sort of face? Does that mean we have a veil on? No. We're not to have a veil on when we read the Bible. But we all, with open face, beholding, as in a what? A glass, a mirror. Is there any a loss of image in a mirror? No. The glory of God. So when we're reading the Bible, we're looking at the mirror. We're beholding in the Bible. And we're to see as clearly as you would see it. someone's face in the mirror. You're to see God in the Bible. As displayed in the life of Christ. And then as we see this, it says... The glory of the Lord, what glory was that? That was the glory that Moses saw, the character of God, are changed. Who's changed? Okay. When you want to put a piece of clothing on, what do you call that? I'm going to go get changed. So at the investigative judgment, God wants to know why he didn't get changed. And there's only one reason why we'll never be changed is because we didn't look without the veil. 
we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's the process from glory to glory. And so Christ regave the Ten Commandments on the blessed Mount of Blessings. He touches the Ten Commandments. You can find all of them in that sermon. He begins his sermon after the Beatitudes. He says, Think not that I've come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill. I've come to take the veil away from reading Exodus 20. I'm going to tell you again in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And so he expounds actually what he always intended the Ten Commandments actually to deliver. And, and how does it read in, in, in Matthew? You know, love your enemies. Bless those that persecute you. If, you. if you want to bless someone that persecutes you, you first need to be persecuted. If no one's persecuting you, you can't bless them. You need a trial in order to develop that character. To those who, what it also says, who persecute or despitefully use you. In other words, for you to be able to fulfill God's character, somebody has to use you. Do you like being used? Do you like being abused? It's not that we open ourselves to be walked on like a mat, but life has these things in it. And they'll increase more and more. And how are we going to deal with it? Are we going to dwell on the negativity or are we going to go to the Bible and gain God's character display in my circumstance? Whatever you're suffering, find a Bible example and look at it long enough to see the love of God in it. And so he says at the end of the sermon, after expounding on how to act in your life, how to put the garment on, he says, everyone that heareth these words and does it. Whoever puts that garment on will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Because he said earlier, people come to me just because they say, Lord, Lord, they won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. He that does the will of my Father will enter in. He's talking about the completion of sanctification. And so I want to just close with Malachi 3, 16 to 18. Probation is soon to close, brethren. We want to be saved. Many things look good in this world. Many people look like good Christians. We may esteem people and think they are what I would call a true Christian and they may trick us. We can't afford to trust in mankind for a display of righteousness. We need to study the scriptures because they testify of Jesus himself. And we need to get that image so clearly that we're looking in the mirror at Jesus. And you won't mistake him if you, do your, if you do the study with the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost will take the veil off. And you will see in the scriptures beautiful character traits that are applicable in your life. If you study the Bible just to exemplify your character traits, a lot of people do, they will make God like their main trait. You'll get a religion... Sometimes the Baptists are very hellfire and brimstone, so they'll show God in that way. And you'll get others that you know, are very um, happy-clappy and charismatic, and they'll present Christ in what way? In a charismatic way. And people can study God in relation to how they see themselves. Do you know what, that, do you know what that's called? That's called idolatry. It's where you make God into the figure you want him to be and then worship it. Whereas if we come to the Bible and saying, Lord, I don't actually know who you are. I know who I am and I'm a mess and I don't want me. I don't want my character traits that I have. If they're, I, don't, I just want to start again. And we come to the Bible wanting to see Jesus for who he is, not for who I want him to be. Then when I study the Bible in that way, I'll get a correct picture of Jesus. But if I, want to, 
if, you know, if I tend towards being um, in bigotry and I want to find Jesus in all his bigotry ways and just capitalize on anything there, I'll find it if I want. If I want to be super liberal and just show how Jesus just doesn't seem to care about the Ten Commandments and just wipes it off the board, I can find that too if I want. But is that putting the garment on? Is that reading the Bible with a veil? It is. We need to come to the Bible and say, Lord, I want you to show me your glory. Just like Moses. Show me your glory. And I want to behold it. And as I look at it and keep looking at it, I will get a change. Change of raiment. A change of mind. And so they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon... It's not how he you spell his name. You don't have to think about that too long. It's about who he is. They think upon who he is. Because isn't that his name? I am who I am. So for those who think upon who he is, the I am, what will happen? God will say to these people, they're mine. These people are mine. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day that I make up my jewels, and I will spare them or save them. As a man spareth his own son that serveth him, then you shall return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. The ultimate test. Your character displayed in the time of trouble will be the proof of your walk with God. Nothing else can prove it. May the Lord help us to keep our garments on that we will not be naked and we can have the privilege of appreciating the garment he's given us by wearing it. Amen.